Oh, hey. you. oh, and you too, love. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get this all set up so that my phone <laughs> sits properly. And you should see this elaborate setup that I've got. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's inside a roll of sticky tape stuffed with tissues to Love hold it, it up right. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so good. Oh my gosh. And you you wouldn't believe how many people it's like, what? I have to do it in portrait? And it's just kind of a crazy scenario. Yeah. True that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'm super excited to have you. And uh, we were even a bit early today, so that's cool. Um, so and you're looking well, lovely, by the way. Oh, likewise. It's so good to see you. It feels like forever. It's been oh, years it and years and years. It yeah. does. It does. It feels like such a long time since we've had a squeeze. So when, we, when you invited me to come on, I was so excited. I thought, oh, my God. And I almost yeah. felt like you've, like, I, I, I haven't seen you for so long, but I think I've been following your journey. I still know, you know. Yeah. So it's I know lovely. It's weird, isn't it? Oh, thank I know. you. And, and likewise. And I think, you know, even though it's, you know, so much time has passed and, we haven't had that squeeze and now the whole coronavirus thing is going on and it's almost like, oh my gosh, you just appreciate being able to get to connect in person. Oh my gosh. And, and then some. And then some. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really grateful to have you on because, um, you know, I've had your beautiful um, friends, um, Cindy and um, Kim Morrison come on and you three uh, have been such a gift in my life before I even got to meet you. Um, oh. because you were kind of my, uh, with your podcast that you guys used to run up for a chat, which I recommend everybody go check out all those episodes because they're super enlivening to the soul. And, uh, yeah. And for me, it was like this feminine connection that I got to be like mm. hanging out with some virtual girlfriends. So really, really yeah. appreciate, appreciated that for sure. Oh, <laughs> delicious, delicious. <laughs> Awesome. So what I'll do is I'll quickly introduce the series and then a little bit about you and then let's dive in and let's um, create some magic for everybody. Love it. Awesome. Sounds good. So we are up to interview number 20. I can't believe it. In the Self Connection in Isolation uh, exclusive interview series where I've been bringing together extraordinary souls. Like, you know, we've got another one in the house today with the beautiful Karen Smith. Um, all across the globe, these um, amazing, wise individuals are who are doing beautiful work through their own unique experiences and wanting to contribute to the lives of others. So my absolute um, pleasure to get to immerse myself in um, each of your wisdom, um, your perspectives and high vibes. I love it. Perfect. So Karen is an amazing leader, a motivator, a survivor, an author of the book Soul Survivor. Um, trainer, keynote speaker. She does amazing talks um, and she's a brilliant human being to get into the energy of. Um, and what I wanted to um, really uh, focus on a little bit with the beautiful Karen today, if she's up for it, because I think that it's super timely um, with everything happening with this pandemic. And of course, you know, experts saying that they're um, very concerned about suicide rates um, up leveling at this time and you know also you know there's a lot of um, domestic violence apparently those rates are going up during this time as well so um, you know Karen has got such amazing experience and uh, and wisdom and what she's been able to transcend and survive is just remarkable so I'm really honored that we've got um, her coming and joining this series today um, because I'd love to hear your perspective, Karen, um, and definitely do some deep dive down the rabbit holes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a specialty of yours, and I absolutely love it myself. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I want to start with asking you, to, though, today, Karen, what are you most grateful for in your life right now? Mm. Well, um, I think it's, you know, I can't, say that I went from zero to gratitude, um, you know, in, in the blink of an eye because it's not true. <laughs> yeah. um, I've ridden the roller coaster of emotions just like everybody else has. And I've often sat back and thought, jeepers, you know, if I'm in this work of mindset and the psychology and spirituality and um, self-awareness, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 
I'm riding a roller coaster of resignation, anger, uh, anxiety, uh, disconnection. If I'm doing that, I can imagine how difficult that is for everybody else on the planet as well. Mm. So in terms of being able to, you know, uh, uh, use all of those heavy emotions as a platform to find the gift. Mm. It's been more for me about um, really reviewing the ambition that I've had in my life, mm. reviewing the, um, the constant need to strive, which comes from a, what I've always thought has come from a really amazing work ethic and I'm a machine man and I can pump out and I'm fast and I love my brain because my brain is so clever and, <laughs> and I've, I've always, you know, uh, held myself to a higher standard and accountable to being that, you know. And so this time has really allowed me to take stock and to be able to not do anything and not feel guilty and to be able to sit in the space of my home and cook a beautiful meal for myself, which I never, ever do, mm. ever do, because I'm not a cook and I don't enjoy it. So <laughs> I never do it. Yeah. Hence, hence raw vegan really works. Yeah. And <laughs> That's so good. yeah. But I, it's been great to actually know this side of myself, which I've never given myself permission to see simply because of my ambition and my A-type personality and my drive and my ability, you know, just because a person can doesn't mean they should. Yeah. So it's been really good to be able to review all of that. So it's been very much an introspective journey for me. But what mm -hmm. I've also found is that just about everybody that I've worked with and everybody that follows me and everybody that I hang with and play with on social media and also in life, they've all felt the same way and it's kind of cool you know it's mm. it's it's going to be very interesting I, I read a post that said um don't be too quick and oh, forgive me if i slaughter it but <laughs> don't be too quick to uh, want to go back to normal because you might want to give yourself a chance to see how much normal you want to take back boom <laughs> I love that. So don't oh be God. too quick yeah. to want to go back to normal because there might be not so much normal you want to take back. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm going to search that. I want to follow what they're saying. <laughs> That's cool. I love it because, um, and I think you're so, you're so spot on. Um, you know, I myself am an, an action taker. And I think um, for me, it's allowed me to slow down and just realize how much of my self worth is tied up with how much I'm doing. You know, um, instead of just being, hang on, am I, am I okay to just be, am I, mm -hmm. you know, and just kind of, like you say, review and just question how much of that normal reality is what I want moving forward. I think that's really, really key and beautiful. So yeah, I second your gratitude on that, um, to slow down. And, you know, it's interesting for me, um, uh, because I'm always reading people through the realm of personality psychology. And I know we've had this discussion um, a few years ago when I interviewed you, it um, uh, must have been probably three or four years ago now. And, uh, and I know you did tell me what type you were in the um, Myers-Briggs system, um, which is kind of foundational to some of the work that I do. And everything you said, I'm like, yep, you're an effectiveness person, you know, and, <laughs> and just get yeah, everything. I'm like, yep. I get it. I get it. <laughs> cool. That's cool. And oh, yeah, yeah I was no. the, I'm an ENTJ mm. in the Myers-Briggs. Yes. Mm. I'm an ENFJ. So we're, we're, we've got some similarities. And, Lots, and yeah. Differences. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I, I just love, I love that you know that so we could, you know, dialogue. But, that's not <laughs> um, but I really want to ask you, you know, also just a bit of a wider perspective, just taking a bit of a meta perspective on this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, what are you, and I know you've got this beautiful lens of your also the spiritual side from your experiences. So mm. how are you kind of taking a, another angle or another look at this pandemic um, and, uh, and what's happening in the world right now? 
It's a really great question. And mm. it's almost as if I relate to it differently day by day, week by week. Mm. Um, I'll have a certain sensation around it, um, mm. which will then change. And then another sensation which changes. And this is the part that I'm actually, you know, initially I was like, oh my God, I'm riding this roller coaster. But now I'm looking at it going, wow, I'm riding these waves. And mm. I'm in a completely different ocean, which I think the first thing I would say is that for most of us in our lifetimes, we've never experienced anything like this. So it's a first. Mm. And because it's a first, the way that the mind works is we always want to know. We always have to know. So what we tend to do is go back to our kit bag of all of our tools and skills and previous experiences and start pulling out stuff to see how we can apply what we know to what's currently going on. But the nature of challenge is actually to force us to do the opposite of that. Otherwise, what's the purpose of it, right? So the nature of challenge is to have us become more than what we were yesterday. And we can't become more than what we were if we're accessing what we've already got. Because what we've already got has brought us to where we are. Yeah. So the nature of challenge is to have us grow into a new skin bag, grow into a new version of ourselves. Globally, I really see that occurring for many of us, and or all of us, obviously, but for many of us, what I'm seeing is initial responses of fear, outrage, conspiracy. And I have to say up front, I'm not going to go into it today, but there are absolutely <laughs> some of those things that have been called conspiracies that I am 100% behind. Mm. Let me just say that. Okay. Um, but I won't go into it today. <laughs> <laughs> simply oh, because get into that rabbit hole but yeah no we won't yeah no 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 no, no. I, and we can if you want it but I, I i honestly think that through um through fear when people are fearful you know that whole analogy of when emotion is high intelligence is low yeah there's been a lot of that and there is still a lot of that and we have to make room for each other because not everybody is going to be the hero in a time of crisis mm -hmm. But there are absolutely those that are heroes in the times of crisis that we are grateful for because they're the ones who hunker down, do the research, um, figure it out, apply it in their own lives, test it, find what works and then share it. And there's a certain, you know, in, in, in this pandemic, there's been a certain group of people or a number of people who've been able to do that at speed. So they kind of say, well, look, I don't really know what tomorrow is going to bring, but based on what we've seen, this is where it is right now. Tomorrow I'll do more research and I'll come back and let you know, and I'll come back and I'll let you know, and I'll come back and I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the, um, the way that the majority of humanity responds to change, you know, like if it's time to change your house or change your job or change your underwear or change relationships or change bank managers, yeah. Most people don't like change and they go into deep states of fear and it begins to trigger a lot of childhood issues and um, yeah. all of that comes to the fore and we can't see through it. And we think that, you know, when people call us out on that, we can't see that that's what's driving us is this deep unconscious programming. Mm -hmm. And therefore we go into defense of it. And when we go into defense of our fear, our fear grows. And it's like, yes, she's with me. And yes, she's behind me. And yes, my fear is right. So the fear grows in, in strength. So I think I'm personally looking forward to seeing the fear and the conflict um, settle yep. so that then clarity can find its natural place. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, in my own sphere, I think being blown up in the bomb, uh, I don't know what I was like before, but I think being blown up in the Bali bombing really created a new relationship with fear, a new relationship with death, a new relationship with perspective, a new relationship mm. with reality, a new relationship mm. with, with presence. So while there have been moments when I've been anxious for my own personal situation because my business has changed dramatically, yeah. 
my anxiety hasn't been for the planet and my fear hasn't been for, oh my God, what about all of us? Mm. Um, and I think it's, and I think that if I'm to think of a gift from the bombing, this is just another one. Thank you very much. Tick. Um, mm. I've been able to keep my shizzle in a pile and keep my anxiety low. So my intelligence can maintain some level of perspective. But shift in perspective, yeah. massive. Absolutely. And, you know, Karen, I thank you for bringing that up. And I, I know, you know, you might not want to go tell the entire story or maybe you may, um, but there are Whatever. people in the audience who, um, you know, they're not totally familiar. Um, a lot of my audience are from America and different parts of the world. And so then they might not know too much about the Bali bombings. Um, but yeah. I would love for you to share with them um, part of your experience and, um, maybe if you want to also intertwine, uh, of course, it's part of the story um, with your ex-partner um, with the with what, taking his life and committing suicide because I think a lot of people will obviously benefit um, from what you're sharing and put things into perspective for them as well. So Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd love for you to share that. Okay. So for everybody that's tuning in and will tune in, um, I guess – my path in this work really accelerated um, back in 2001 when my partner of eight years um, committed suicide. It wasn't something that I saw coming. He showed me no signs. He was a strong, silent type. Um, our relationship was definitely in trouble, but, you know, we'd been in trouble before and survived it. So um, I wasn't expecting that that would be how he would uh, respond to the trouble that we were having. So it came as a really big shock to me. Um, I am, you know, I'm just like a kid. You know, I'm not a very mature person. I'm like <laughs> a kid inside. <laughs> I'm not grown up at all. So... <laughs> So for me, it was, you know, I'd never, I'd never experienced anything like that. I was 31 when um, Greg took his life and he left me a, a, a voicemail message and um, left me lots of clues as to, you know, that it was my fault that I was the driving force behind him taking his life. And I really didn't have a frame of reference for that kind of experience. So, of course, I took that all on board and I made it my responsibility and I shouldered it. And I felt that it was just and it was right that it was my responsibility to shoulder his suicide. I mean, you know, our relationship was in trouble. Uh, I was guarding my heart. I'd withdrawn myself from the, uh, the deep pain that he obviously was experiencing that I had no idea about. And um, I was just trying to protect myself from the deep pain that I was experiencing in our relationship. So the, what, the way that I looked at that was how could I have been so blind? How could I have been so selfish? How could I have been so self-centered that I missed it? And um, that took me down a very slippery slope of my own suicidal depression as a result, feeling that I deserved everything that I got, feeling that happiness was not ever going to be something that I would experience. And it wasn't because the world wouldn't let me experience it. It was because I wasn't willing to let myself go there ever again because of what I had done. Mm -hmm. And I went down the slippery slope where I became very disassociated from reality, very disassociated from humanity, that I took myself to Bali for his 12-month anniversary. And I had full intentions of taking my own life. And I had really like I say, disassociated from reality, not understanding for one moment that I would be putting my loved ones through what I had been going through. That never occurred to me, not even for an infinitesimal second of time, not even for a moment. And my two best friends came with me to Bali and we landed on the 12th of October, 2002, which is the date of the 2002 Bali bombings where we were, both, we were all three in the Sari Club. The bomb went off at about 11.30 Bali time and um, both of my two girlfriends were both killed and I was blown backwards 
um, into what I now know was a giant pit. Um, the left side of my skull was completely crushed in. And the only reason that I survived was because when I was thrown backwards, I was thrown backwards into the bottom of the pit and all of the bodies uh, that didn't survive landed on top of me. And the roof of the Sari Club landed on top of us. So um, I managed to get myself out of that and I managed to, you know, find my way to a hospital with the help of a really great Australian guy. If you're tuning in, Jeff Smithers is his name. He got me to um, hospital and cared for me. And there was another really amazing guy, Frank Morgan, who was there from the Australian Federal Police. And he helped the doctors stitch or staple my head with 38 staples um, mm. without any anaesthetic, which was, you know, you'd think would be horrendous, but it actually wasn't because there was so much adrenaline in my body. I never felt a thing. I heard it, which was, yeah. <laughs> but the... <laughs> I've got such a weak stomach for those sorts of things. Yeah. But, no, um... me too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So eventually I was, you know, uh, taken to the Balinese hospitals where they wanted to operate on me. But, you know, I shared eight needles with six people in that room. And I knew that obviously there was something very serious in terms of my injury, that if I was to be operated on in Bali, there was very little chance of me surviving. Yeah. Um, and eventually I got myself home where I was operated on and um, I was very lucky to be alive. The doctors in Bali had told me that I had a window of six hours to live, but I had to make a decision there for myself. I was either going to um, try and keep myself alive or I was going to die in the Balinese hospital. Mm -hmm. And I chose trying to keep myself alive. And it's, it's an interesting you know, dichotomy there because I'd gone to Bali to take my life and then found myself fighting for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, eventually I got home um, and discovered that both Jodie and Charmaine had both been killed. Mm -hmm. And that was another layer. You know, it was another layer on top of my own healing, but a layer on top of I'm responsible for Greg's death. Now I'm responsible for Jodie and Charmaine's death. And because they wouldn't have been in Bali had it not been for me, you know, they only came to support me um, without any knowledge of knowing how suicidal I actually was, because that's one of the gifts that a <laughs> gifts, one of the strategies that a very depressed or suicidally depressed person um, has is the face to the outside world shows nothing and gives away nothing of what's going on inside. So there's a lot of, um, people that I work with now and families that I work with now who I support whose people in their lives have taken, you know, family members or friends have taken their lives and they had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because we're the masters of disguise, you know, and I had no mm -hmm. idea when it came to Greg either. So he was the master of disguise also, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I went on to recover from that experience but I want to say to everybody listening you know I mean this might all look very healed and it, it very much is because it was you know a long time ago and I'm very much on the other side of it however there was a big journey that took place in order for me to go from there to here and a very big part of that journey is being of service to others who suffer. And I would say 90% of my healing has come from being of service to others that suffer. And being able to do that meant I had to study psychology. I had to, you know, I chose to become a master practitioner in NLP. I chose to run programs and seminars and I chose to further my education and I'm, you know, a perpetual student. So I can always be of service. And now I don't, I'm not just of service to those who suffer. I'm just of service. Mm -hmm. And um, I've 
I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the experience because I don't think I would have reached this place or platform without that. Would I give anything to have those lives back? Man, all of it. But that's not what is. That's not the reality. And the reality is I am here and I was given a second chance and my job is to make my life extraordinary and to be extraordinary and to be profound and to be connected to the source of all of life and know that so that then I can be the conduit for all of those who haven't had a bomb under their butt to wake them up yet. Wow. And I accept my role as a way shower and I accept my role as a light um, mm. graciously and passionately. Mm. And hi, I'm Karen Smith. I'm an Aquarian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Oh my gosh. Um, Karen, I, uh, every time I hear your story, it still touches my heart. Like it, my, my eyes, um, cry from a place of inspiration you know um because Same here. Um, oh like just just you know i feel into your story but like what i'm so grateful for about you is just how how much you do show up and how much how much what you've experienced you've turned into gold you've turned poop into gold right like it's just <laughs> you know just like one of the some of the most tragic circumstances you've been able to transcend and not and I and I love your realness you know like it's it's not that you're saying oh yeah no problems at all and I never experience any negative emotion or all that crap you know it's it's hey this is a journey this has been part of my journey and yeah you had to experience a lot of pain um, to get to this point, but you're such a gift to everybody that you connect with. Um, you're a gift to me, to our audience right now, and who'll be listening to this absolutely. And I want to, I want to ask you because you know this is so so important. I think right now to understand that people who are on the brink of potentially taking their lives are, mm. like you say, those masters of disguise. Mm. And you know that from both angles, you know that from not being able to recognize it in somebody else. And you also know it because you were there um, inside of that. And I wonder if you could share with us what would be kind of your advice right now? Like if, you know, even if, how could we check with the people that we love? Like how mm. could we, um, you know, if we're not sure, or even if we don't think that at all, but maybe they are that master of disguise, like, how could we do something now that could potentially save somebody's life? Oh, and another really amazing question. Um, you're really good at this, by the way. Oh, good. Oh, you're, you're very good at what you're doing too. So <laughs> good combo. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I want to say, and um, I'm working with a handful of families at the moment who are currently experiencing exactly what you're mentioned here the first thing that I want to say is that um, you know it's not for us to take responsibility for somebody else's actions you can never know somebody completely you only know what they want you to see and if you think about that in your own life, you're different with your mum to who you are with your partner and you're different with your dad to who you are with your brother and who you are with your sister is different to who you are with your girlfriends. So we show a different side of ourselves to different people in our lives. Therefore, it's impossible for us to feel that we can know somebody entirely and completely. Therefore, you can never take responsibility for another person's willingness to live or die. And to think that we can do that is attributing too much power to ourselves. So don't think you're that powerful because you're not. 
a person will always choose in favor of their own will and their own desire when it comes to that life and death decision. And you think about it yourself, not that it's life and death, but I'm just trying to give you guys a bit of a frame of reference here because unless you've actually been on the very knife edge of suicide and chosen not to, and the very knife edge of suicide is not the cry for help. The knife edge of suicide is the complete vacancy where there is no love for self, no love for other, and the pain exceeds the ability to cope. There's a complete blankness and nothingness. There's no connection. So the cry for help, there's still a connection because there's still the deep sorrow and there's still the deep pain and the deep depression. Like at that point, there's still things that we can do. But when we're at the knife edge, we're at the most, I guess, dangerous point. And it's at those points that it really is up to the individual as to which way they sway. Mm -hmm. So that for those that are left behind, try and shoulder responsibility. It's impossible to take responsibility for that point mm -hmm. because it's a very deep and a very personal experience that in fact is closed off to the world outside. If we step back from that, from the knife edge to the cry for help or the simple disassociation, there are still things that we can do there. And I want to say that the person, as they go to that disassociated place, what they're feeling is a very deep lack of love. And spiritually and psychologically, we know love is a pill that is an enormous healer love of self and love of other and love from other, but see love from other, we can, like I can feel all of this love for you, but you can't feel that. You can't feel the love that I have for you. Only I can feel that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Like I could be feeling a whole stack of love for my, my partner and he's in the other room watching TV. He can't feel this deep, gorgeous, warm fizziness inside of me that I have for him. He can't feel that he's watching telly or he's cutting his toenails, you know, like he's, not, <laughs> he's, gone, he's oblivious to it. Yeah. So when somebody is in that dark place, love is the key. Love absolutely is the key. So what we want to try to do is switch back on their ability to love. We want to use ourselves or things that we know they love. We want to switch back on the key and use those things, switch back on the switch mm -hmm. and use those things as a key to unlock the love in them. Because mm -hmm. we want to start to have them self-generating love. So just putting it out there, if ever I get there, people, no animals is the key. <laughs> Give me something fluffy and you'll have me there like that. <laughs> it could be yeah. nature. It could be food. It could be, it could be swimming. It mm. could be meditation. It could be cuddles. It could be beauty. Mm. You know, if, I'm, if I think of you, Beauty is one of the things I know you love. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we want to try and use the things that the person, we know the person loves and the things that they've shown us, you know, mm -hmm. that those are the things they love. Use those as keys to unlock the lost love inside of them. Mm. And don't stop. Shower them in it. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And shower them in your own love. Mm -hmm. Like let them know that you're not going away and you're not leaving them. You're going to walk beside them every step of the way. Mm -hmm. But what we do tend to do is we do tend to um, try and make them feel better. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say don't do that. As much as that's hard, especially if it's your kids 
or if it's your parents um, or your family members, don't try and make them feel better because all that happens is you're invalidating how they feel. Meet them where they are instead and validate how they feel. Because the minute we try to make them feel better and say, oh, why don't you come and watch a concert with me or come and cook with me or come and sit with me or shh, there, there, you'll be all right, don't cry. The minute you try and do that, you force the person into defence. And the minute you force them into defending their own way of feeling, they're trapped in it again. You know, because you, th you think about the minute you try and defend your view, you're holding on, aren't you? Yeah. You know, somebody says, oh, no, you should think the way that I think. You're going to go, no, I want to think the way that I think. I want to feel the way that I want to feel. And especially when it comes to those darker emotions, when they have had their way with us for a long time. And anybody who is in that state of depression or state of suicide, it has not happened like that. It's a slippery slope and it's taken its time and, mm -hmm. and it's carved a really strong neuro neurological path and the mm -hmm. cells inside of their body are feeding on those neuropeptides. Look that up if that language is a little bit um, obscure for you. But the cells in the body have become used to feeding on those. So the minute we try and take those away, the cells of the body are going to start screaming saying, no, you can't take it away, you'll starve me. The brain goes, yeah, but I don't know what else. I don't know what else, what other neurological path to run if I'm not running that. Mm. And so it's as much as a mental, physical, and spiritual dilemma that the person is fighting through to come out the other side. Mm. So that's why patience, persistence, consistency, mm. um, gentleness, it's vital if we're going to be able to be that support person for somebody who's in that spiral. Um, but I, I, I want to make a claim here or a, or a disclaimer, not a disclaimer, but a caveat here in that do not mistake melancholy, anxiety, sadness, disconnection for suicide or depression because they're two very, or they're very different experiences. Melancholy is natural. Sadness, it's natural. If it goes on for a prolonged period of time, and that's, you know, person-specific, but if that goes on for a prolonged period of time, we might have something that we need to deal with. But let's not confuse what's natural and what's normal with mm -hmm. depression and anxiety and, uh, sorry, with depression and suicide, which I think in our society we kind of have done that a little bit. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I want to ask you a question on this because it's something I've been diving into in my own personal growth journey, um, particularly over the last year, um, mm. is actually getting out of this um, positive psychology, uh, mm. which is kind of a layer of development just to choose your state of being. But at some point, you have to transcend that. And I feel like uh, my experience is in order to um, get to the next level of your development around your emotional intelligence, it's actually the opposite. It's actually to own and acknowledge and honor and accept, you know, your actual true emotions to, to have those validated, like you said. Um, and it's the perpetual cycle of those quote unquote negative or heavy emotions that we have is because we're judging them. We don't want to feel them. Other people are judging them in a way that maybe is, um, has good intention, like you're saying, where it's, hey, I want you to feel better and I love you and, hey, maybe this will help and maybe that will help. But like you said, that's just invalidating and keeping that cycle of that um, heavy emotion going on to the point it sounds like it reaches a place of hopelessness where, hey, like, this is never going to change. This is never going to get better. Um, and like you said earlier, the pain exceeds that desire to, um, to, to live, you know, um, to, to make a change to, um, you know, yeah, just to live. So is that, is that, uh, uh, is that kind of, is that resonating with you? Does that make, is that what you're sort of saying? It's, it's, um, it's less about trying to feel good and it's more about owning the reality of our emotional experience. Yeah. I think that's such a, a great way to sum it up. I think, mm. Um, you know, uh, 
We have emotions, but we are not the motion, the emotion. I have a fingernail, but I am not a fingernail, <laughs> you know? So our emotions are all just part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. And I think what's been missing in terms of our education around our ability to relate to each other and to relate to ourselves is that un is understanding the purpose of emotion. Because if we understood the purpose of emotion, we wouldn't be so um, tied to it. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that the, whether an emotion, so if we have like, I'm just going to use my little Apple pen here, yeah. but say we say <laughs> that this is equilibrium and equanimity. Yeah. Above the line here is, above the equanimity is great elation, enthusiasm and excitement and joy and bliss and OMG shizbangs. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. all the feel goods and that yep. the bottom under here is the anger and the sadness and the negativity and the resentment and the resignation all the feel bads you see we we somewhere along the line and this has been handed down generation after generation have been conditioned to see this is good and this is bad but in actual fact both states are not equanimity both states are heightened it's just that we've become conditioned to see these as good and these as bad. So avoid these and strive for these. If in fact, what we had been taught is the purpose of emotion, there would only be a bag full of emotions. Mm -hmm. And we would then see the purpose of bliss is peace. The purpose of bliss, a purpose of enthusiasm is creativity. The purpose mm -hmm. of joy is playfulness. The purpose of happiness is life. The mm -hmm. purpose of sadness is, um, uh, and this is just for me, right? Yeah. And what, what I want to say is, is, is that's the individuation of mm -hmm. emotion. Yeah. Because for me, the purpose of bliss is, is um, you know, uh, uh, Cre or a purpose of joy is create of enthusiasm is creativity. That's what I'm just remembering right now. Yeah. Simply because I did that exercise with myself this morning. Yeah. So the purpose of the enthusiasm is creativity. Now for mm. somebody else, the purpose of enthusiasm may be peace. Mm. That's where individuation comes into play is that what is it for you? And in this moment, what is the purpose of sadness for you in this moment? Now, for me, when I'm thinking of sadness, I put sadness in one in my left hand because I'm right hand dominant. So I go, sadness, you can sit in that hand. What is your purpose? Why are you here? What's the direct opposite feeling? Not word, but what's the direct opposite feeling of you for me? And the direct opposite of sadness, if I just take myself there right now, the direct opposite of sadness for me right now in this moment is it's, it's, it's uh, peace, actually. Mm -hmm. Which means I don't want to get rid of sadness. I have to keep sadness because it's the flip side of the same coin. Mm -hmm. It's just that I have a better relationship with sadness than what I do with peace. So thank you so much, sadness, for being present in this moment. Thank you for that. You have become the platform to launch me into peace. So I now know that every time I feel sadness, I must reach for peace because you're here to educate me. Thank you. Oh, I love you. You're a gem. You're the greatest gift that I've got in my life right now. Let me hold you. Let me have as much of you as I possibly can get because I know on the flip side of you is peace. And I really need a lot of peace in my life right now. So you're teaching me that I must reach for peace. Now, do I know how to reach for peace? As a matter of fact, I don't. <gasps> Universe, mm -mm -mm, you've brought me a challenge. You've brought me a challenge to reach for peace when sadness is present. Mm. Now, I don't know how to do that, but I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. So let me find people who's, who know who to reach for peace in times of sadness and let me model them or let me Google it and see what Google's got to say about that. Let me read some books. Let me start asking some questions, even metaphorical questions. And you'll find that the universe always responds to your willingness. So as soon as I say I'm willing to learn, 
how to experience peace in times of sadness, but I don't know how. The brain, the mind, the body, the whole lot sets a, sets a course of action that becomes magnetic. And have you ever noticed synchronicity always mm -hmm. meets you where you're at? Have you mm -hmm. ever noticed how beautiful that works, that when you say, I don't know, but I'm willing to learn, all of a sudden <laughs> someone turns up and has a conversation like this. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you'll read a book, you'll see a video, you'll see quotes, and they'll be like, there's a sign, there's a sign. Mm -hmm. That's showing me how to reach for peace. Mm -hmm. Great, got it. And that's the purpose of emotions. Anger. Anger is not a bad emotion. It's a hot one and it's yeah. got lots of energy behind it. But jeepers, mm -hmm. creepers, sometimes we damn well need that. Absolutely. You know, sometimes we've been sitting around with thumb up bum <laughs> far yeah. too long. And if I think about all the anger that's on social media around this pandemic right now, I think, mm -hmm. man, you know what? We need that. We have been asleep for far too long allowing our control to be in the hands of our governments and in the hands of those with all the money and in the hands of all those with all the power, we have not been responsible. And now we look, you know, here's a rabbit hole, but now we look at just Australia, our manufacturing has been outsourced, our decision-making has been outsourced, our money is outsourced, our health is outsourced. Those are all of the things that give us power in this realm and in this arena of life. And we, are, we have been rendered powerless because we have had our eyes closed. We need that anger. We need that fury. We need that heat. And we also need to recognise that that emotion is here to serve a, a purpose. What is the direct opposite of anger? for each of us individually. And we must now use that anger as a platform to reach for. For me, the direct opposite of anger is clarity yeah. and action. So now mm -hmm. I must use that and say, okay, well, I've had my time in anger yeah. and now I must understand what that's for. And now I must take action by clear action mm -hmm. based on intelligence, based yeah. on collective intelligence based mm -hmm. on research and based on heart's deepest desire rather than mm -hmm. mental furniture yeah. filled with furniture that is an old house that I used to live in. Mm -hmm. The yeah. old way of being won't work. Mm -hmm. So if we just go back to what we've had, taking our normal with us, it's not going to work not for any of us individually or collectively. So now we need to furnish, furnish a new home. Mm. What do we want to put in there? Yeah. Mm. Karen, that is so beautifully put. And I'm so grateful um, I asked you that question because that was absolute gold. And you know, I think bringing it back to that, because this is such a problem. People's suffering is caused by their lack of understanding that there is purpose behind every emotion, even the ones Absolutely. you don't think you want to feel. And you know, you bring up anger. I think that's such a good one because for me, when I learn about the purpose behind emotions, um, anger was one of the first ones, um, you know, I learn about. And it was when we're feeling angry to know that we're feeling disempowered. That's why we show up and we get angry. We're feeling disempowered in some way. And maybe that's different for, for different people. Um, like you're saying, and to know that, okay, anger is here to serve me. I can channel this an energy towards empowering myself. But, um, right. but, but what we need to do is to accept the emotion, to feel the emotion, to not judge the emotion so that we can, like you said, get out of the fear-driven, unintelligent part of the reptilian part of the brain and calm it down to a place of, okay, now, like, what's the other side? And how do I channel this energy to, to move me in the in that direction, which is really to get you to the other, to the equilibrium, you know, to, to get out Absolutely. of the extremism. Mm, so and I think that's the key, isn't it? It's that's the key. Like if this is equanimity yeah. and if this is equilibrium, the yeah. key is to be here because this is where, you know, the, um, in, uh, um, I want to say Ayurvedic, but also there's a, in Eastern philosophy, this is the no thing where there's no this and there's no that. 
This is the no thing. And in the no thing is everything. Because in the, in, in, in the no thing, there's clarity, there's direction, there's adventure, and you can flick up into here and you can flick down into there, but you're yeah. doing it from a position of knowing that's what you're doing. Yeah. And I used to do, I used to have an exercise result where I would write down the center of my, my middle finger here six minutes because I thought it doesn't matter the matter, it doesn't matter the emotion I'm feeling. All of them are, you know, it's like, it's, it's exhausting, you know, it's really yeah. exhausting. So mm -hmm. six minutes I'm allowed to indulge in the feeling. Yeah. But then at the end of six minutes, and I would time myself and I'd go, right, I've got six minutes to feel irritated or six minutes to feel whatever. Yeah. And I would time myself. But the interesting thing is the minute I time myself, I'm now focusing on the time rather than the emotion. <laughs> so it's kind of like a stepping yeah. stone. So yeah. I'm focusing on the six minutes and I'm raw and I might write about it or I'll post about it or I'll, you know, whatever. <laughs> And then at the end of that six minutes, I go, right, okay, life is passing me by. Find the purpose in why I'm feeling that emotion at this time mm -hmm. and springboard from that into the purpose that it was meant to serve, whether it's a positive emotion or negative emotion, either one, find the purpose it was here to serve because life's passing me by, man, and I've got shizzle to do, you know, so... <laughs> If I'm sitting around in a great state of excitement and bliss and enthusiasm, I'm still inactive. Yep. If I'm sitting around in a great state of irritation and frustration, I'm inactive. Mm -hmm. It's only when I'm in that state of equanimity that I'm mm -hmm. in flow. Mm -hmm. And everything I want is in equanimity. Mm -hmm. So I'm allowed to feel the emotions because I'm human and I'm going to because it makes life juicy and it brings so much color and so much texture to every moment but i must understand that equanimity is home it's home and in home is everything i want and i don't believe that we have had that education when it comes to emotions, we just bounce from being angry to bored to excited to enthusiastic to hateful to, you know, all, we just bounce. And then yeah. the times when we are in equanimity, we, we're unconscious. We're not even aware that we're actually home. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that, you know, I know that I'm bringing a spiritual bent to this, but Consciousness mm -hmm. is the very thing that sets us apart from a rock. And our ability to be conscious of what we are in every given moment is the one thing we can control. We can control that. We can have self-awareness and consciousness and presence of mind enough mm -hmm. to know that at the moment I'm making a raw smoothie let me check in with how I feel. Am I here, there, or in equanimity? I'm in equanimity, man, and I'm <laughs> smelling that pineapple, and I'm, sm you know, and I'm present, yeah. and it's delicious. Mm -hmm. And a really easy way for everybody listening to get from the juiciness and the rich textures of all of the emotions. I'm not saying don't have them. It's what gives mm -hmm. us color. But to get from all of that to, 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 to this... Just be present. Mm. And in presence, you'll notice is also silence. Silence mm. of the mind, silence of the heart, silence of the body, silence of the cells, silence of everything. It's just become present in this particular moment. Focus on the detail. And I read a beautiful quote that said, God is in the detail. Now, I'm not religious at all. I'm very spiritual, but I'm not religious. But I think if you take out God and replace it with universe, the universe is in the detail. So focus on the detail, on the tip of the pen, mm. and in your present. Mm. You know? Mm. Oh, stop. Mm. I love it. <laughs> oh, it's delicious, oh gosh, isn't could, it? Oh, my gosh, totally. And I, I honestly, I feel like I could sit in your presence and hear you talk into so many things all day long, every day, and I'd be a very, very happy woman. I'd be in total equilibrium. And equanimity, oh. and I just be in flow. But <laughs> that's what we want. That's what yeah. we want. 
Absolutely. And that's why, um, you know, I really want to acknowledge you, Karen, uh, just for the woman that you are, for, for the human being that you are, and for the work that you do, and for everything that you share, I can tell you do it from the inside out, you know, from your experience, from your heart, from, from the pain, from the bliss, from, from all of it. And you articulate it in such a way that we can all gain value um, from just you sharing. You know, you don't, you don't, you simplify it for us all. And I think that every single one of us um, can take so much from today's uh, episode and to apply it to our lives on so many different levels from helping and supporting the people in our lives, but not taking responsibility. Um, you know, and I, I know this one big time being a very big rescuer in my life and, you know, taking a hundred percent responsibility for other people um, means that simultaneously you're taking 0% responsibility for your own life in those moments. So true. that. Um, I think you've, you've shared so many brilliant um, parts, but I know Instagram kind of knocks us off um, right on the 60 minute mark. Um, and I know we got on just slightly early, so I want to be um, cautious of the time. So I get to say goodbye to you. Um, but did you have anything else that you um, wanted to share? Um, just a short message, whatever comes to heart for everybody during this time. Um, really quickly, you know, uh, follow me, follow, you know, follow everybody that you feel drawn to yeah. that is able to support and inspire you. And this is a time for inspiration. And from a spiritual perspective, inspiration means being in spirit. So allow your spirit to come to the front and come to the fore and let that out to play rather than your intelligence bring your spirit out and let the world see who you truly are and set yourself mm. free, you know? So do whatever it is that gets you there. Mm, thank you so much, Karen. And um, where can people best connect with you um, and the work that you're doing and, and purchase your book, Soul Survivor? Um, yeah. yeah. How can they so, do that? KarenSmith.com and you guys will see how my name is spelled a little bit differently. So just yeah. go to Karen, KarenSmith.com. And you can also follow me here on Insta. You can hit me up on Facebook. Um, you'll see very quickly as soon as you put my name in to uh, Facebook, you'll see me. You can also follow some of the work that I'm doing around suicide prevention at spirithive.org and mm -hmm. also spirit, hive, spirit underscore hive here on Insta and um, spirithive.org on Facey. You can see some of the uh, work that we're doing there. We have a not-for-profit organisation where we um, have a big group of volunteers that all works towards supporting people and families. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, I will have all of that linked up um, as this episode goes across all the platforms and everybody gets to tune into the juiciness that is Karen Smith. So appreciate you, beautiful soul, and can't wait to get to see you again in person, give you the biggest squeeze <sighs> ever. Bring it on. <laughs> um, but thank you again for joining us. You're such a delight and I look forward to next time. Right back at you, sister. Okay, beautiful. See ya. Bye, everybody. Thanks to everybody who could join us. Um, we got some good comments, actually. Uh, Nasa said, beautifully explained and put together. And Tim said, um, and I hear I perceived that was ineffable. Um, and Jerry is loving this. Awesome. Awesome. Much love and see you, see you guys next time and uh, see you soon, hopefully, Karen. Much Bye. love. Bye. <laughs>